This chimp and I are cousins. We share an ancestor who lived only six million years ago. Take off my suit and his hair and you'd find it hard to tell us apart. Our genes are pretty much the same. Maybe so. But where I can talk to camera, he communicates in grunts. And where my species rules the world, his still lives in trees. For centuries, philosophers and scientists have sought to fill the gap between us and our nearest relatives. They've claimed human qualities for apes and apish qualities for humans. And yet, the question remains, what ultimately makes us human? In this series, I will attempt to answer this question, not by digging up ancient fossils, but by looking at abnormalities that reveal the workings of our minds. My answers will come from within ourselves, from our genes. And these answers, although provisional and incomplete, will also be deep and beautiful, and perhaps a little dangerous. For they will change not only the way we understand ourselves, but may even change our species. Where do we come from? Where are we going? The history and the future of our species seem so opaque to us. And yet, there are some disturbances in nature. Some errors that open a window beyond the present. And that's why I've come to Pakistan, to the Punjabi city of Gujarat. I've come here to meet a remarkable woman. Her name is Nazia. She is severely mentally disabled. She has the intellect of a one or two year old child. And she has a very small brain. In Pakistan, people like Nazia are known as chuas or rat people because of the, the rat-like shape of, of, of their faces and their heads. The medical term, however, is microcephaly, from the Greek, microcephalos, literally small head. And for some reason, this disorder is more common in the Punjab than anywhere else on earth. One explanation can be found at the shrine, the tomb of Shah Dullah, a 17th century Sufi saint. Local tradition credits him with the gift of curing infertility. And barren women still come here, hoping that the saint will help them conceive. But, so the story goes, there is a cost. The first child born will be a microcephalic and must be dedicated to the saint. Chuas are, as it were, the price of divine intervention. It's a silly story. The idea that Nazia has been cursed by a Sufi saint has, from a Western point of view, a distinctly medieval flavor. There's another explanation for microcephaly, one that has nothing to do with Shadula, but invokes an altogether more sinister force. Chuas, this theory goes, are not born, but made. They are deliberately deformed as infants. Metal clamps are put on their heads to restrict the growth of the skull, and so retard the brain. There are thousands of Chuas in the Punjab, and most are owned by gypsy beggar masters who care for them and profit from their begging.
Here, in the encampments where they live, it's easy to believe that chuas are being deliberately manufactured by a gypsy mafia. And yet, however plausible the bonsai theory of microcephaly may seem, it's simply not true. The idea that you could restrict the growth of a brain by clamping it in order to produce a microcephalic skull is simply nonsense. A child's brain will always grow to its natural size. If you try to stop it, it will simply ooze out through a hole in the base of the skull, compress the spinal cord, and kill the child. Oh. There's another reason for thinking that microcephalics aren't the products of Punjabi head shrinkers. Simply put, it's that there is a history of them in other parts of the world as well. In the 19th century, microcephalics were a staple of European and American circuses. Advertised as Aztecs, wild men, or simply pinheads, they were invariable crowd pleasers. But then, this was the golden age of the freak show. In the 1860s, Karl Vogt, a German anatomist, studied them as no one had before. Inspired by Darwin's new theory of evolution, he wanted to show what Darwin had only hinted that humans have evolved from apes. He collected the skulls and brains of dozens of microcephalics, measured them, and compared them to chimpanzees. He argued that microcephalics were a kind of evolutionary missing link. Not ape, not human, but something in between. Vogt's reasoning was straightforward. Humans have big brains, apes have small brains. Microcephalics are humans with small brains. They must be atavisms, throwbacks to an ape-like condition. He even called them Affenmenschen, ape people. It's an ugly term, and it's wrong. Microcephalics are human, as human as you or me. And when, inevitably, Vogt's theory was discredited, microcephalics slipped into scientific oblivion. And so it has been for a century and more. In Pakistan, the Chuas follow the calendar of religious festivals, dancing and begging as they go. They are bought and sold, cared for and exploited by their masters. Generation after generation, they remain. Recently, however, scientists have become interested in microcephaly once again. The causes of the disease have been discovered. There is talk of eliminating it altogether. What is more, it does seem that the Chuas of Pakistan can tell us something rather wonderful about the history of our species. Today, Pakistan is home to the largest concentration of microcephalics in the world. Known as Chuas, literally rats, the cause of their disorder has long been mysterious. Pakistani food is just fabulous. <laughs> but that is now changing. We have no friendship, but, uh, in Pakistan, uh, this is a family with three microcephalic children. They've not been forced to beg or live in camps, but simply brought up as if they were normal children. The eldest is 14-year-old Avez. When Avez was born, we are happy that uh, we have a son. But uh, I realized his head is so small, it's uh, 
uh, eyes are so closed. I'm very worried. They tell, uh, tell me your baby is microcephalic. I'm shocked. I'm shocked that my baby is uh, microcephalic. But these people are very nice. They need help. They need love and care. Families like this have transformed our understanding of microcephaly. Unlike the Chuas, abandoned as infants and raised as beggars, they show that the disorder runs in families, that it is caused by genetic mutations. These mutations are found in people everywhere. But the reason that microcephaly is so common in Pakistan is due to the Pakistani way of marriage. About 60% of marriages here are between first cousins. Interfamily marriages would always concentrate genes. There might be two carriers in the family getting married to each other, and if two carriers get married in the family, then there's a 25% chance in every pregnancy that they might have an affected child, you know. There has to be some sort of a mutant gene in this family, which is giving rise to these abnormalities. By analyzing the DNA of Pakistani families like this, geneticists have identified six different genes which, when mutated, cause microcephaly. Mina, how about yes? And while nothing can be done to repair the mutant genes, it is now possible to screen for them before birth. Indeed, a genetic test for microcephaly was used for the first time in this very family. Ready, say cheese. Arvez's mother, Rubina, has now had two healthy children. Her sister-in-law has had a healthy girl all born with the help of genetic screening. Take your hands away from your face. <laughs> Smile. Cheese. Will genetic screening eliminate microcephaly in Pakistan? Inshallah, inshallah. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what, this is one condition which we might be in a position to control. If we manage to locate all the families, we'll be in a position to control the birth of further microcephalics. But this story is far from over. The discovery that microcephaly is a genetic disorder has enormous implications for the understanding of human evolution. One of the most exciting projects of 21st century science is underway here in Chicago. Its goal is the identification of the genes that make us human, or more precisely, the genes that distinguish us from the great apes. The project has been led by geneticist Bruce Lon. We are remarkably similar to chimps at the DNA sequence level, but obviously, biologically, we're very different. I think what that implies is that there has been very, very intense selection in the evolutionary history of our species after human-chimpanzee divergence that has altered our, our biology in profound ways, particularly the biology as it relates to the brain. When Lan and his team heard about the Pakistani microcephaly genes, they realized their significance. Any gene which, when mutated, prevents the brain from growing must, when working properly, be needed for the brain to grow. Oh. Lan was particularly interested in one microcephaly gene. A gene called ASPM. Our organs grow as the cells within them divide and multiply. The cells that drive brain growth are called neuroblasts. The ASPM protein 
hair colored yellow, is needed for their division. It helps the cell's chromosomes find their way into daughter cells. We examined the evolution history of this gene in primates and also a large number of other species, and we saw that there's a very dramatic acceleration in the rate of evolution of this gene, specifically along the lineage leading to humans, suggesting that this gene is doing something to the brain that would make the brain perhaps bigger and more complex. There are, no doubt, hundreds of genes that influence the growth of the brain. But ASPM is special. It's an ancient gene. Found in all animals, it's probably a billion years old. In most animals, and for most of that time, it's evolved slowly. But not in the recent history of our species. Six million years ago, the lineage leading to humans splits from the one leading to chimpanzees, and the evolution of ASPM begins to speed up. Our ancestors' brains expand at an astonishing rate, and the result is a human species with a brain three times larger than that of any ape. Ever since Aristotle, philosophers have wondered, what makes us different from the beasts? Their answer is that man is a political animal, a thinking animal, a tool-making animal, can now be discarded. Now when we ask what makes us human, we can answer this gene, and that one, and that one. We can begin to write the recipe for making a human being. ASPM is the first ingredient, the first gene that we know of that has played a part in the evolution of the human brain. Without it, Homo sapiens, wise man, would be rather less wise. But what sort of brain has ASPM helped produce? This is a human brain. It is said to be the most complex thing in the universe, and perhaps it is. But more importantly, it is, or at least was, the source of every hope, thought, and memory that its original owner ever had. When you look at a human brain, what strikes you is its size. Here, by way of comparison, is the brain of a pig. Now, adult humans and pigs have bodies which are pretty much the same size, but the difference in the size of their brains is immense. But to really understand what makes the human brain special, you have to cut it up. It then becomes clear just how much of the brain is made up of cerebral cortex. This sheet of neurons, which has been folded on itself again and again, it's the part of the brain that has expanded so enormously in the course of human evolution. It's the part of the brain with which we think. There's another, more sophisticated way to see the structure of the cerebral cortex. MRI scanners take exquisite pictures of the living human brain. They provide the disconcerting experience of seeing the contents of your head. This is a mathematical dissection of your brain, and this particular slice is showing your frontal cortex, just as if we took a knife and sliced through your head and brain and are looking straight on on this slice, and we can see the cerebral cortex 
and the gray matter around the edges, and we can see the white matter, which are the bundles of nerve fibers that connect the gray matter areas to each other. So it seems like there's quite a lot of gray matter and white matter there. Quite a big looking brain, I'd say. Yes, uh, the, uh, the combination of gray matter and white matter is very important, and one without the other doesn't do you much good. But, I mean, there's a lot of it compared to most other people, right? If you're trying to get me to say that this is the best brain I've ever seen, I'm happy to say that. Oh, that's, that's very kind of you, Richard. <laughs> In the 19th century, the French physician and anthropologist Paul Broca argued that there was a link between brain size and intelligence. He brought new precision to craniometry, the science of measuring skulls. Using lead shot, he estimated the volumes of hundreds of skulls, hoping to prove that great scientists, writers and politicians had particularly large brains. Not everyone agreed. For decades, anatomists debated whether or not a big brain really makes you smarter. And when Broca himself died in 1880, his own brain was measured. To the satisfaction of his opponents, it proved to be quite average. In the 20th century, Broca and his fellow craniometers became radically unfashionable. Their conviction that brain size had something to do with intelligence was deemed elitist, sexist, racist. Maybe so. But was it wrong? In the 21st century, MRI technology has allowed psychologists to reevaluate Broca's claim. I want you to make your blocks look just like the one pictured here. Go. Dozens of studies have shown that, all other things being equal, people with larger brains have higher IQs. Big brains really do make you smart. Even if you believe that IQ scores aren't a perfect measure of intelligence, done. And I don't think anyone argues that they are a perfect measure of intelligence. They are an indication, a summary, if you will, of the overall pattern of a person's strengths and weaknesses cognitively. And really, it's now very well established that there is a relationship between whole brain size and general intelligence. Done. Is this random? I don't think that's likely. Done. Repeat these numbers after I finish saying them. Seven, nine, three. Of course, intelligence isn't only a matter of brain size. Seven, nine. The way our brains are wired up, the speed at which they work, even the relative size of different areas, all affect intelligence as well. Five, eight, one, nine, mm, two, six, four, seven. Nevertheless, it's clear that we have evolved a big brain with a magnificent cerebral cortex for the sake of a superb intellect. But the question remains, what exactly is that intellect for? The answer is rather surprising. It involves sociopathic youths fundamentalist Christians and Shakespearean murder. Chimpanzees are our nearest living relatives. Genetically, we are startlingly similar. Our genome sequences are 99% identical. But in the last six million years, their brains have hardly grown while ours have trebled in size. Why? What exactly are all our extra neurons for? One answer is that humans are much better at solving problems than chips. We can use tools. We can even make them. But so can chimps. 
These are captive apes in a rescue center, although they've never been in the wild. Given a bunch of twigs and branches, they can work out how to make dipping sticks, just as they would in a forest. But instead of dipping for termites, here they have to make do with yogurt. They're quite impressive for chimps, which qualification simply highlights how much better we are at manipulating the physical world. But there's another way in which we are smarter than chimps. One that's more surprising and perhaps more important to our evolution. We are better at lying and cheating than they are, but also at empathizing and making allies. We have social skills that are so much part of our daily lives that we do not notice them until they've gone. In the 19th century, as the American Railroad was pushing into the wilderness, tunnels were being built, mountains flattened, and accidents were common. In one celebrated accident, a laborer called Phineas Gage had a metal bar blown right through his head. He should have died, but he didn't. Even his intelligence was unaffected. And yet, he changed. Where previously he'd been a friendly sort of chap, now he was sullen and withdrawn, morose and foul-mouthed. People said, old Phineas, he's just not the same. The strange case of Phineas Gage was a landmark in the history of neuroscience. Here, for the first time, was evidence that particular parts of the brain control social skills. As the metal bar passed through Gage's brain, it damaged an area known as the prefrontal cortex. That part of the brain has certain sectors that are very related to how you connect with others, to how you solve uh, social problems. Uh, and that part also happens to be very much connected to the regulation of emotions, especially a range of emotions that we can call social emotions. The idea that the prefrontal cortex regulates social behavior became the rationale for a new operation. And orbital lobotomy is a simpler approach to the frontal In the 1940s and 50s, American neurologists performed thousands of transorbital lobotomies, surgically mimicking the injury experienced by Phineas Gage. This is a boy of 19. He heard voices accusing him of abnormal sexual practices and believed he was the second coming of Christ. Here he is shown a day before transorbital lobotomy. <laughs> Transorbital lobotomy was performed on August 1st. Within a few days, the patient resumed playing the saxophone. Given that the prefrontal cortex affects social behavior, presumably there was a logic to doing these lobotomies. Of course, there, there, there was a logic. It was, in, in fact, a perfectly brilliant uh, and uh, still valid logic. But one can question the way many of those operations were done but the logic was perfect. All primates have a prefrontal cortex, but humans have one that is disproportionately large and packed with neural connections. As a result, other primates simply don't have the social skills that we humans take for granted. The Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, researchers are trying to find out whether a chimp can follow the gaze of a human. It looks simple, but for the chimp to pass the test, it must understand that the researcher is drawing his attention to something. In a very basic way, the chimp must read her mind. So far, so good. But what happens when the test is made a little harder? 
Another researcher shows the chimp a grape and then hides it under a cup. When the barrier is removed, he tries to show him where the grape is, but to no avail. The chimp doesn't understand that the researcher is trying to help him. He doesn't understand his intentions. Children, by contrast, are naturally very good at understanding the intentions of others. Here, an adult researcher is oblivious to a puppet show. Perceiving this, the child tries to attract her attention. This is the prefrontal cortex at work. One human brain inferring what another one knows. Psychologists call this inference theory of mind. It's something we all use relentlessly. Without it, we would come socially adrift. If you're going to interact with others, you need to decide on whether or not what people are doing is in fact what they mean, whether they can be trusted, or they're lying, and it's inconceivable that you could successfully manage complex interactions among um, human beings without having a, a theory of mind. <laughs> My noble lord, what dost thou say, Iago? The best way to appreciate how theory of mind works is to turn to drama. First to last, what dost thou ask? But for a satisfaction of thought, no further. Virtually every Shakespearean play hinges on the way characters understand and misunderstand each other's intentions. Oh yes, and went between us very oft. Indeed. Is he not honest? Robin Dunbar is an evolutionary psychologist fascinated by Othello. What does thou think? He sees it as a model for how the human mind has evolved to cope with many levels of social complexity. does mean something? and society can get very complex indeed. Othello thinks that Iago is his friend and confidant. But in fact, Iago seeks to destroy him. That's right, he's going to do it by persuading Othello that his wife Desdemona is having an affair with Cassio. Now, in order to do that, Iago has to keep three minds in the frame at the same time, his own mind, Othello's mind, and Desdemona's mind third-order intentionality. But there are other minds here. Oh, yes, just the audience's mind. They've got to see the whole picture for themselves, so they have to operate one level higher, at fourth order. And beyond that? Well, beyond that, the Shakespeare. When Shakespeare puts the scene together, he has to go one step higher to fifth-order intentionality because he's got to intend that the audience believes that Iago wants to persuade Othello to believe that Desdemona is in love with somebody. Fine. But what does this all tell us about evolution? Well, I think this microcosm reminds us of just why we have our big brains. We really need them to find our way about this very complex social world in which we live. Now, if this was a chimpanzee, they would never be able to understand what was going on, even if they could speak language. The fact that their minds are limited to second order at best means they simply wouldn't be able to follow the plot. And Desdemona, having failed to pick up on higher levels of intentionality, is about to come to a sticky end. Out, strumpet! Weepest thou for him to my face? Oh, banish me, my lord, but kill me not. Down, strumpet! Throughout the play, the only character that remains blissfully unaware of the schemes afoot is Desdemona, Othello's wife. It's too late! And so, she dies. The idea that our brains evolved to cope with the complexities of social life is an intriguing one. And it's one written in the history of our skulls. These are the primates. Lemurs over here, great apes down there. They've been arranged in terms of the size of their brains, small to large. 
But what's really interesting is that had we arranged them in terms of the size of the social groups in which they live, the order would have been much the same. The bigger the brain, the bigger the social group. So what about humans? Well, if this relationship between brain size and group size holds for us too, then we should live in groups of about 150. And this is how we have lived for most of our history. Hunter-gatherer clans number about 150 people. So too, before the Industrial Revolution, to the typical English village. These days, however, you have to travel to places like the Badlands of Montana to find communities that are still the size for which our brains were designed. The Hutterites are fundamentalist Christians. Five centuries ago, they lived in southern Austria, but then religious persecution drove them first to Eastern Europe and in the 19th century to North America. Wherever they've gone, they've lived in splendid isolation, shut off from the outside world in their own self-sufficient communities. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have four sisters and one brother. Six and all? Yeah. It's a big family. Yep, it's fairly big, and uh, the oldest is 26, and the youngest is nine. How many cousins do you have? I don't know for sure. 50. <laughs> 50 cousins? Uh-huh, I'd say. Hutterite families live together in colonies, sharing everything, food, work, and money. You could call them Christian communists. What makes them so interesting is that no colony ever grows larger than 150. When it reaches that size, it splits in two. A new colony is formed elsewhere, and the old colony starts growing again. If, if you've got too many people, you can't control them. Just like you read in the Bible where Moses was uh, out and his uh, father-in-law, he was going to handle all the people by himself. He said, get smaller groups, like 100, 150. And then he did that and he could handle them. That's exactly where it is in the colony. The Hutterites are a natural experiment in social living. They could live in groups of any size they pleased, but they seem to find communities of about 150 people just right. They haven't chosen this number because any evolutionary biologist tells them they should. Instead, it's a number that seems to have emerged out of 500 years of communal life. It's a number that to them makes social sense. The Hutterites' way of life seems impervious to the modern world. They do without television, radio, or the internet. They don't read novels or newspapers. They find all the intellectual stimulation they need in religion. But what about the rest of us who are not Hutterites? The three billion who now live in cities. If our brains evolved to live in communities like this, how have they adapted to the urban jungle? Is it possible that our brains are still evolving? Are we getting smarter? Maybe so. Six thousand years ago, human history was changing course. Across the fertile plains of the Middle East and Southwest Asia, people were becoming farmers. Instead of hunting and gathering their food, 
they were now growing crops and rearing animals, in much the same way as peasants in Pakistan do today. The consequences of the farming revolution were immense. With more food, more people could live from the land. The villages became towns. Civilizations were born. That's an old story familiar to any student of ancient history. But what's new and really remarkable is the recent discovery that at the same time, our genes began to change. Among them, ASPM, the gene discovered in Pakistani microcephalics, one of the genes that has shaped the human brain. 6,000 years ago, around the time that urban civilization began to expand, a new variant of ASPM arose and started to spread through the human population. And it spread fast. So fast that it must have been driven by natural selection. It must have been good for something. But what? The suggestion is that it has made us more intelligent. Well, not all of us. This new variant is still working its way through the human population. About 10% of people in the world have just the new variant. 50% have just the old and the rest of us have one of each. Which raises the question, what about me? Do I have new variant ASPM, old variant, or both? To find out, I need to take a genetic test. Five cc of blood, ready for analysis. And now I have to wait for the results. It turns out that you are what we call a heterozygous, which means that of the two copies of the ASPM gene in you, one is the new recent variant, and the other is the ancestral variant. So, right. I don't know if that makes you happier or, or, or less happy, uh, surprised. It's or... a rather boring result, it isn't it? It is a boring it? result indeed. I mean, you're telling me that as far as these genes are concerned, I'm just utterly average. You're utterly average, yes. Hmm. Well, it's somehow not entirely a surprise, I suppose. <laughs> so there it is. I have one copy of ASPM pointing to the evolutionary future, the other to the past. Does this matter? Not really. At least not yet. There isn't any evidence that new variant ASPM really does make you smarter. But studies are underway, and we'll have the answer in a year or two. Even if ASPM isn't an intelligence gene, make no mistake, such genes exist. There clearly is a genetic component to intelligence. It's likely not to be a simple genetic story, but at the same time, the genetic technology is accelerating very quickly. It won't be long, certainly within our lifetimes. We might be able to tell from genetic analysis what a person's potential is. Already, you can be tested for tens of thousands of genetic variants. It costs no more than an intercontinental flight. These variants affect health, looks, and personality. It's only a matter of time before intelligence is added to the list. So is a new eugenic age at hand? It's a frightening thought. The eugenics of the early 20th century, which saw the elimination and sterilization of the weak, 
for the sake of genetic hygiene, has barely faded from living memory. Will it happen again? I doubt it. If the old eugenics was driven by ideology and the state, the new version will be driven by the market. Genetic screening will be an instrument of the competitive society. Think about it. What will we do? What will you do when intelligence genes are finally discovered? The answer must be that employers will want to test their employees, teachers will want to test their pupils, parents will want to test their children, and lovers will want to test each other. They will do this because the society in which we live is becoming ruthlessly meritocratic. To the cognitive elite go all the goods. To the cognitive underclass, nothing. And any parent will want to do all she can not to leave the genetic constitution of her child to chance. For the first time in history, we will judge each other not by where we come from, or how we look, or even by what we've done, but rather by the quality of our DNA. After a billion years of evolution, the gale of natural selection that has pushed our intellect so far and so fast is beginning to fall quiet, extinguished by our own technologies. In the next program, I'll be looking at the qualities that have enabled our big brains to dominate the planet. How we became so much better than any other animal at imitation, language, and culture. And at what cost? We are the only animal that defies the evolutionary logic of its genes. And now, we are living with the consequences.